Welcome to online worship from the Two Rivers Benefice, and thank you for joining us. All the words for the service will be shown on the screen, and the words that we say together will be shown in yellow type. And now our opening prayer. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's now take a few moments to say sorry to God for all the wrong things we do, think and say. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As sisters and brothers in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. You made us to be one family, yet we have divided humanity. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You were born a Jew to reconcile all people, yet we have brought disharmony among races. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You rejoice in our differences yet we make them a cause of enmity. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so may God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, 
will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance, 
He would not even look up to heaven, but his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Good morning, everybody. Now, Two Rivers regulars will know that in recent weeks, we've been looking at a book in the Bible that we know today as Two Timothy. And a bit of a boom, boom, I see what you did there moment. It's a letter from St. Paul to Timothy. It's one of those books in the Bible that if you're skimming through, it seems to be bog standard Christianity, but with a lot of practical stuff thrown in. I wonder why that is. Well, let's see if we can find out. And the letter is to Timothy, a young Christian, and it's from Paul, who's telling Timothy that the gospel, which is church speak for good news of God's love for us, should be Timothy's number one priority. So what's different, we say in 2022? We hear this kind of thing every single Sunday, except when we're, when we're in Acapulco or recovering from a sleepover. Every Sunday, someone at the front dressed up is telling us that the gospel should be our priority as well. So before we look at what Paul is writing to Timothy about, let's look at what the gospel is, the good news. And it's this. After however many gazillion years of waiting, God has at last stepped out of eternity and back into time. God has stepped out of infinity and back into the claustrophobic confines of north century earth. But instead of zapping the planet with light or appearing simultaneously everywhere, he came as a baby, as a human being, a hundred percent God, yet also a hundred percent man. Because God is saving the light zapping and simultaneous appearances for later. And the baby grew into a man and did some amazing things and said some amazing stuff. And he was then betrayed and killed. He was publicly executed. And here's the thing. Three days later, he burst through the impenetrable wall of death. He defeated it because he was God. And the gospel simply says that God loved you and me so much that he did all that for us so that we can have an eternal future to look forward to. So in answer to Bob Geldof's question at Live Aid in 1985, is this it? In answer to the question we so often ask ourselves as we look at our lives and say, is this it? The gospel tells us, no, there is so much more. And so in Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to guard the gospel in chapter one, make sure you remember what it is and how it works. In chapter two, he says, look, Timothy, you might have to suffer for the gospel because some people in power are going to feel very, very threatened by it. In chapter three, Paul is telling Timothy not to give up on the gospel, even though it's being ridiculed or twisted by others. And in and in this last chapter, 4, Timothy is to continue to proclaim the gospel, to keep telling people, share the good news at every opportunity, because you just don't know who might need to hear it. Now, if Paul sounds a little bossy in this letter, if Paul is being blunt and forthright with Timothy, it's because time has run out. There's probably not going to be a tomorrow. It's winter in AD 64, and Paul is in the Mamertine prison in Rome. He's been there a while. He's had his main trial, and all that awaits is the judge's verdict. At the first hearing, Paul had no legal help at all. He'd become too dangerous to be associated with. What was going to happen to Paul might well happen to all his friends and associates as well. But that didn't hold Paul back. Human friendship and companionship is hugely important, but Paul needed more help than that, and he tells Timothy that it arrived. In verse 16, At my first defence, nobody came to my support. Everyone deserted me. But the Lord 
stood at my side and gave me strength and I managed to share the good news of God's love even in court. And Paul tells Timothy that only Luke, Dr Luke, the physician, the gospel writer, has stayed with Paul. Now we tend to have in our minds Paul the missionary and Paul the theologian and Paul the founder of churches. But here in chapter 4 we also see Paul the human. It's winter, the prison's cold, his judgment may come through tomorrow or it could be delayed for months. And so in verse 13 he says that when you come bring the cloak that I left with Carpus. Paul is cold and he's bored. And bring my scrolls, he says, especially the parchment, because Paul doesn't want to waste the time left to him. He wants, even at the end, to be learning more, studying more, writing more. And the clock is ticking for the Christian faith as AD 64 becomes AD 65. Because in AD 64, Rome was governed by one of its most brutal emperors, Nero, who re reportedly played his violin whilst watching his city Rome burn in the background. That was in AD 64 and there would be reprisals, a scapegoat must be found. And so in AD 65, St Paul, dead, executed. St Peter, dead, executed. Jude, dead, executed. Nathaniel, on the run, and he only lasted until AD 69. Andrew, already been killed, and James was an early casualty. And so it's fair to say, without exaggeration, that in AD 65, Christianity stands on the brink of annihilation. St Paul is handing on his baton to the next generation. Who has he picked? Somebody perhaps with some political clout some legal eagle who can convince the Roman courts to permit the gospel to be shared. Or what about a military man? We know that there were Christians in the ranks of the Roman legions. Now, I remember in my school days, we used to choose teams for a scratch game of soccer or cricket. And the two captains would be appointed and then they'd pick their team from the remaining boys. And nobody ever, ever wanted to be the last boy who was picked. But seemingly, at a human level, that's exactly what Paul has done. He's picked the shy guy. He's picked the inhibited weakling. Because we know that Timothy was young. We know that he was very reserved. And he was also often in poor health. And so here we have Paul, who is about to become yesterday's man. And his pick for tomorrow's man doesn't look very promising. But you see, it's not man that does the choosing here. It's God. God has always chosen those he wants for a specific task, at a specific time, in a specific place. And today God may well be calling you for a specific task, at a specific time, in a specific place. It might be really, really complicated, but it's more likely to be really, really simple like sharing the good news of the gospel with the person next door, inviting that lonely person in for coffee and a chat. Simple perhaps, but it can be difficult nonetheless. What if they say no? And what if they think I'm a religious nutcase? And anyway, surely it's Jonathan and Teresa and Sue's job to do all that, isn't it? Excuses, though. But God's heard them all before. He called Moses. And Moses said, no, send my brother. He's far better looking than I am. And he's a far better speaker. God called Jonah for a specific job at a specific time in a specific place. You want me to do what, said Jonah, as he got on a ship heading in the opposite direction? God had a specific job for Isaiah, the prophet, who said, I'd, I'd love to help, but deep down, I, I'm not a very nice person. Choose somebody else. And God says, I've heard it all before, and I've chosen you. And the person God has chosen to keep the church going in the middle of the horror that was AD 65 was Timothy. And he was succeeding Paul. And Paul writes in verse 6, My days are numbered. 
I'm like a glass of wine that will be emptied onto the table to placate the wrath of Rome. I'm like a boat that's being untied from the dockside, heading out into the night on its last voyage. And Timothy, I've stuck at it. I've fought the good fight. Don't throw any towels in for me, please. I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. And if I can do it, Timothy, then so can you and you and you and you, David Buckley. Paul goes on in verse eight. Now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not just to me, but to all those who have, set, who have accepted God's love through Christ Jesus. A crown of righteousness, Timothy, do you hear that? But in the meantime, could you bring me my cloak because the weather's getting colder? And all Paul can do is to give the letter to Luke and to trust that it will arrive. And this last letter that Paul would ever write ends with two phrases that sum up the way Paul has lived since he encountered Jesus on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus and his life was changed. Paul had received grace from Christ and he wanted to return all the glory to Christ. From him, grace. To him, glory. And in all our Christian life and service, we can find no better motto than that. So was Timothy up to the task? All he had to do was remain faithful and carry out Paul's instructions. Did he do it? Parts of the Mamertine prison where Paul was kept still remain. Underground dungeons that you can still access. Ironically, you have to go through one of the two churches built on the site that are still there today. They're an eloquent testimony to the willingness of Timothy and others to respond to God's love for them. Nero could never stamp out Christianity. How can you stamp out God's message of love and hope? And in fact, in AD 68, just three years later, the Roman Senate condemned Nero to death. Meanwhile, the gospel was spreading all around Europe, and eventually it came to our villages here in North Essex and our lovely old churches testify to the tens of thousands who have encountered Jesus within their walls. People like us. Thank God for Paul and for Timothy. Let us now respond by affirming our faith together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. Father of all, we bring before you the universal church, all of those brought together as one, through faith in your Son. Help your church to be the place of love and unity that you have planned. May your people be united and love one another. Heavenly Father, you have taught us through your servants and Francis that all creation is your handiwork. Grant us your grace that we may exercise wise stewardship of this earth, tread lightly upon it and cherish its resources, that our children may enjoy its riches throughout all generations, and your name be glorified through all that you have made. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the leaders of the nations, that you will guide them in the ways of freedom, justice and truth. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our enemies and those who wish to harm us, that you will turn the hearts of all to kindness and friendship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Ukraine and other parts of the world that do not know peace. We pray for the wounded and the captive, the grieving and the homeless, that in all their trials they may know your love and support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time of year, when we see churches and chapels have been filled with the fruits of harvest, that ministers must tread carefully over flowing sanctuaries, communion rails and altar steps were full of flowers, hops and wheat. Choir stalls rose above the apples and pears and tomatoes. Cucumbers were positioned with green-fingered pride beside bread shaped to sheaves of corn. For it was a time to be thankful. As farmers looked at the fruits of the fields and gauged its worth, we must consider our harvest, the harvest of days and years, the harvest of time, taking in all that which is good. There have been doubts and fears, mistakes and pain, but they have withered, overcome by deep-rooted trust, overshadowed by the blossom of laughter and friendship. Like the farmers, we are known to have complained, to, to complain, yet through all the disappointments, the harvest of the years has been rich in experience and love. Lord, your harvest is the harvest of love, love sown in the hearts of people, love that spreads out like the branches of a great tree, covering all who seek its shelter, love that inspires and recreates, love that is planted in the weak and the weary, the sick and the dying. The harvest of your love is the life that reaches through the weeds of sin and death to the sunlight of resurrection. Lord, nurture our days with your love, water our souls with a dew of forgiveness, that the harvest of our lives may be your joy. Lord, hear our prayers. Let's now share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
And now our closing prayer. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And so go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>